Tractate Bavar Metziah, very beginning, page two, it's about to say Shechianu, we reach this milestone. Maharsha, in Tractate Avodah Zarah, Daf Yudalev, page 11, he's talking about the great Segula. So the idea that people pray and said, Elaka de Meir Aneini. The Almighty of Meir, answer me. So the Maharsha tried to explain to us what is the definition, what is the Hagdara, what is the idea of that Zgula that people use so much, giving tzedakah, lighting candles, and said, Elaka de Meir Aneini. So he explained in a beautiful way that the Almighty is the one who brings the light upon the world and he lightened the light of our people since we not in a long time from now reach the festival of light the festival of Hanukkah and one of the four galuyot, the four exile is the Galut Yavan the idea is that it was a great darkness and the Almighty with his great kindness brought the out of this terrible Galut Yavan Nerot Hanukkah. So when one said Elaka de Meir Aneini, it means the Almighty that Heirat Klal Israel that lightened the entire nation of Israel toward our holy Torah, as the text said, Kiner Mitzvah ve Torah or because the lighting of the Torah even a small light remove a lot of darkness so that's the idea of God helping those who spread the light of the Torah to the world and that's our prayer before we beginning this beautiful tractate that the Almighty Ya'ir Eneinu lighten our eyes those who occupy themselves in study of Torah and Ya'anevi Yoshia and help and guide all those who dedicate themselves to study of Torah Amen before we go to this uh, beautiful chapter of Shnayim Ochazim, I would like to share with you a very basic definition. I assume that those who join us in a previous tractate know already, so it will be just uh, refreshing. The first definition is Hamotzi Mechavero Alav Araya. If Reuven hold a property, movable property, and he said it's mine, and Shimon comes in and he said, no, it's mine. The burden of proof is upon Shimon. Shimon needs to prove that the materials Reuven hold, it's his. Hamotzi mechavero, if you want to pull it from your fellow, you have the burden, alav hara'aya. So in order to have kinyan, acquisition between the two parties, you have the responsibility to prove that it's yours. So therefore, we have in the upcoming Mishnah several definitions. One, when you have this type of disputation, and you see soon in this tractate, as the rabbi said, if one, one, one wish to be a wise person, should occupy himself with the monetary disputations. So since here we have the concept of Yachloku, two people disputed over something, each of them claimed that it's his, so there are situations that we decided to split. There is another situation that we said, Hamotzi Mechavero, the burden of proof, Alav Araya. Is another concept, it's called Kol De Alim Gvar. That sometimes it's a ownerless property and someone pulled it and he is the one who did it forcefully and it's his. So all those important definitions in the case of Sveikot and uncertain, that's basically the framework of um, this the upcoming discussion. The Tosfot tells us the reason we start with this chapter, it appears that it should be the next chapter, which is Elu Metziot Shelo, why we start with Shnai Mochazim, of two people holding a material and fights over ownership. He says because in the previous parak, at the end of Tractate Babakama, we dealt with the issue of Chalukah, of dividing an estate. We dealt with the last segment of a carpenter 
and someone works for the carpenter and there's materials left over and the question is what belongs to whom of those materials that left over especially you can hire a contractor to for example to fix your uh, door or force it or something and it may be a stolen item that he took while he did a job on site in a previous place so since the previous um, chapter dealing with inyanei chalukah of dividing an estate so therefore this is the reason why we started it's like continuation others hold that it's only Sha'ar Metzi'a, meaning we have the three tractates, which is Baba Kama, Baba Metzi'a, Baba Batra, it's all one. And therefore, the Baba Metzi'a is just the middle, but as we said, the Ran and the Ramban said, the idea of the chapter, it's, the, it's not really in his place, but the reason it's because it is true that Elu Metziot, dealing with Chovat um, shava, the obligation to return a, law, a lost item. But, because we have this previous discussion, and because, according to the Rosh, in Tosfot Rosh, it's dealing with a city, that uh, the majority of the uh, um, inhabitants were non-Jews, so therefore the mitzvah of returning a lost, Hashavat Avedat Achicha, that's particularly applies in this circumstance which is very few people who care for that cloth and therefore the question is to whom you give the metzia, the lost item so we are the top of the page Shnaim Ochazim Betalit Shnaim Ochazim Betalit two people come to Rabbini court holding a garment so Rashi said to us and I'm quoting word by word Davka Ochazim Specifically when two people are holding this type of um, garment. Because he said, Dishnehem muchzakim ba, ve'ein leze koach ba yoter mize, that neither one of these two, let's call them Reuven and Shimon, have more than the other. Why? She'ilu ha'ita be'yad echad levado. If one of them hold it and the other one claims it's mine, then, as we said, ha've'ida ha'motzi mechavero, ve'alav le'aviraya, he is the burden of proof that it's his. So the Mishnah said, two people come to court holding a garment together. One said, I found it in the um, uh, ownerless spot, it belongs to me, and the other one said, it's mine. I have it there. Zeomer kula sheli vezeomer kula sheli. Later the Gemara explain why is the kefel ashon, why you need to say it twice. But the idea is each of them claim it's only mine. Now soon you see the difference between only mine versus one person admitted that the other have something. Because the moment you said it's only mine and I'm the one who found it, so therefore zei shava she'en lo pachot michetzia. Excuse me, by force of circumstance, we impose an oath that each of them declare that they are not, have the ownership less than a half of that. And therefore, after taking an oath, you have to divide between them. So obviously, the Sma and the Choshen Mishpat and Kufla Medchet and many others said, uh, when you talk about talit, talit, meaning the piece of garment that is called talit, <laughs> you can't cut it. It's not mishpat shlomo, you're cutting a baby to two. You can't. So the idea is you take the uh, monetary value of that uh, garment. But um, <clears throat> I saw in a book by my brother-in-law, I have a great Torah scholar brother-in-law, Rabbi David Avram Mandelbaum of Nebrak, and he... Um, is uh, he have endless books, but one of them is Daf al Daf, which means every page in Talmud is a Klein uh, publication. So he brought the story from the Belzer Rebbe. He said that when he was a, a, a young man, and he started learning tractate Baba Metzia, so they ask him a question. They ask him, is that mean that he's real talit, or uh, is just a garment? So the, he holds that it's just a garment. Why? Because, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher said that this is the city, that most of the inhabitants are idolaters. So if you talk about real talit, talit of mitzvah, 
So, so it belongs to a fellow Jew, he's not mitya'esh, he's not um, express um, desperation or giving up on that. So therefore, you have to say uh, that it's uh, really beggar, it's just a regular garment. Anyway, <coughs> so that's the first uh, um, scenario. The second one, and soon you see the difference, two people hold a garment. Zeomer Reuven said, Kulasheli, meaning I'm the one who get it and I'm the one who get it first. So just for people who are not so familiar, I'll just give you an example. Imagine um, you're going to a place like Amazonas, South America, and there is a lot of um, raw diamonds or raw expensive material, blood diamonds, right? So imagine two people uh, see a diamond that can be worth tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. One person hold it. The other person, as we explained by Vakama, can be a fellow that just figured out what do I have to lose if I come to court and claim that I am part of that. The worst case scenario, they're not giving, giving it to me. Versus if both of them at the same time get it. So what I try to convey to you is it can be a very expensive proposition when it's come to this uh, disputation. So here we have a garment. And Reuven said, I'm the first one who saw it and it's mine. And Shimon said, which is Shimon hold that we are um, Meiri explained that we get there together and I have 100%, um, 50% of that. So here's a little different because in a way Shimon admitted that Reuven has a half. I give you just an example that not long ago came to court. It was a, a case of two brothers. And one brother took everything that uh, belongs to the, the, the late uh, mother. And the, the father is, is no longer among the living for long ago. So one brother came, came in and said, well, I agree that he's my brother and he deserves half. I just feel I deserve the other. Versus if the other brother come in and said, no, it's all mine and I deserve everything. It's two different cases. So here you have a situation that the second fellow in a way admitted that the first one have half of that. So if that's the case, we treat it differently. It says, So the one who claim everything is mine, so he needs to take an oath that he have no less than 75% or three quarter. Because, in a way, that free him from the half that is undisputable since the other party agreed upon that he, he have a half of that. Versus the other fellow that said, I own a half. The moment you say a half, you already gave up half of yours. So therefore, as he doesn't have less than a half from that quarter from the entire valuable item, which is no more than 25%, and after they took him out, because now what happened here, Reuven who claimed that it's all mine, he take, after taking an oath, 75%. Shimon that agreed that Reuven have 50%, and he claimed only for the other 50%, then he need to take an oath that he have no less than a quarter. And therefore, his part is only left with 25%. So basically, the way of splitting is splitting the 50% between the two parties. So the whole declaration in advance makes a huge difference between the first scenario, that one declared total ownership by each party, versus when the second party agree upon that the first party have 50%. So Tosfot Arosh, and you see it in other Rishonim, ask a question, you see it also in Tosfot. We learn in Tractate of Amot about Safek Yavam. For those who um, uh, remember Tractate of Amot, Reuven and Shimon. Reuven passed away childless, and Shimon has the obligation to marry, either to marry or to redeem or to free his, um, so his brother's surviving wife. Now, what happened, unfortunately, Shimon did not follow the rules, which is you have to wait 90 days to make sure that the wife of the deceased is not pregnant. But instead, what he did, he married her, cohabited with her, 
before the 90 days took place. So in one hand, he did the Yibum, he did the act of Levirate marriage, but he did it inappropriately early as day time. Now, unfortunately, the result was the wife have a baby. And the baby was born after that act of marriage about seven, seven and a half months um, past that marriage. And the question is, is that baby, this is before DNA, um, uh, it's a son of the late Shimon, or is the son of surviving, uh, the late Reuven, or the son of surviving Shimon. So that's called Safek Yavam Shebau Lachlok. Now it's inheritance that left from the deceased can be, for example, the wife, which is the mother. Now, this child, let's call him Zvulun, that child is a question if he's a child of the living Shimon or the deceased Reuven. So he come and he wants to have a portion of that inheritance. So we learn in Tractate of Amot, Ein safek motzimi dei vadai. If you have a quandary, if you have predicament, if you are in the dilemma, you're not sure about something, you cannot impose upon something that you know it for sure. The fact is that Shimon said, I'm definitely the husband of the late um, um, uh, uh, wife of my uh, deceased brother, and I definitely have 50% of that, and I may be your father. So therefore, the question is, Tosfot, Harosh, and others ask, why you don't use the same term as um, um, we use here? The explanation was a great rabbi by the name of Rabbi Shimon Shkop. He wrote a lot of um, very uh, erudite and sophisticated writing and, and response in the Talmud. He explained that there's a huge difference between Yerusha and Metzia, between law of inheritance and the law of founding items. Why? He explained and elaborates, trace a scenario, father left ten sons, and ten sons get portion from his Yerusha, from his inheritance. We have a concept that's called Brakar e de Avuha, that each one of the ten sons has an equal, in a sense, that he has the entire Yerusha. The fact that you divided it, we treat it as like each son gets everything. You dividing it because of the, by force of the circumstance. So therefore, when we speak about Yavam, we said that Ein Safek Motzi Midei Vadai, if something that is uh, not clear, you cannot pull out for something that you are 100% here. Here, you have a situation where Ruven lift up an item, and Shimon agreed that we will then have 50% of that item. So, therefore, you now get the point why the rabbis ask for taking an oath, and eventually the other party will get only 25%. Uh, it's a side note that in nowadays, when it's come to uh, real court sessions, rabbinic court, is a question, you have people who doesn't want to take an oath. They're afraid of the decorum, Torah, the Yanim. They don't want to take an oath. And Midrabanan, by the rabbinic rules, um, if someone refused to take a Yeshvua, they can put a Shamta. But um, sometimes people lose money just because they don't want to go to the notion of taking an oath. The, another rule is um, applied to Behemat Efkeo. It was an ownerless animal. And the Mishnah said, and soon you see we can have a derivative to practical halachot. You have two people who are sitting in a riding position on the back of an animal. Those days, can be even nowadays, but in those days is, they have a donkey, they have a camel. Now the thing is, it's hefker, it's ownerless. Another scenario, Oshaya Echad Rochev Ve'echad Manhig. In those days, it was one fellow that's sitting uh, in a riding position on the an animal, and the other one was leading by the halter, the animal. So the question is, Ze'omer Kula Sheli Ve'ze'omer Kula Sheli. 
The first one said, I get it from an ownerless spot. This animal is ownerless and I'm the first one who acquired it in its mind. And the second one said, it's all mine. So the question, what are you going to do now? You split the animal? How you do it? So they said, Therefore, the first fellow needs to take an oath that he has no less than 50% of the ownership. So therefore, the second one needs to take an oath that he does not own, have ownership or less than half of it. And then they divided the animal. So we learned several things here, the Maram chief explains. Number one, we learned that um, when we have a riding animal, a leading animal has the same equal rights when there is a healthcare animal, which is an ownerless animal. Um, <clears throat> now, obviously, um, we are talking about uh, either value of animal, if it's going for shechita, or the compensation for an half. But the Mishnah concluded and said, Bizman shehem modim, if they admit to the validity of each other's claims, meaning that they agree that they get it together, or sheyesh lahem edim, or they bring a witnesses attesting to their claim that they lifted up together, cholkin belo shvua. So they divided the, the disputed item without taking an oath, because it's an oath is only administrated in a case when the parties have no other way to prove their claims. So, <coughs> um, the idea that you divide it without taking oath, it's obvious, there's no need to, Rashi said, to go, but the, the old Hiddush here, that if Besdin, if the rabbinic court already rules that they need to take an oath because they disputed over something, they argue, and then they decided, both parties, that they lifted up the animal together, so therefore, that's the chidush that cholkim belo shvua. You can divide it without taking an oath. The Shara Mishpat is a beautiful writing, um, scholarship writing by one of the um, past generation rabbi. It's called Shara Mishpat. He asks, how exactly you divided it? Um, because if the Bet Din, if the rabbinic court decided to do it without taking an oath, because Ruven Makhish, Ruven denies it. So he said, you know, it's the, the core chidush here is the vision. You have two set of witnesses, so even one set, but each party feels, Ruven and Shimon feels that I'm the first one. But when you have a cross-examination of, um, of the witnesses, it turns that they see both of them reach together um, that item at the same time. So since that's the testimony, that's the way they, they, they have it from those AD, therefore Cholkin Belo you divided it without taking an oath. <coughs> I'd like to share with you just few alachot I'm reading from uh, my dear um, uh, colleague and friend, Rabbi Steinzels, in the current um, translation of English. He brought the Shulchan Oro Mishpat 138. In the case of two people, who are both holding on to the same item or animal, and each one claims ownership of the entire item, each man takes an oath that he has a right to the item he is claiming, and that he owes no less than half of it, and they divide it. Now, he continued on and said, if two people claim ownership of an item, and one claims all of it, while the other claims half of it, the one who claims all of it takes the oath that he has ownership right to the item and, the, and it owes no less than three-fourths of it. And the one who claims half of it takes an oath that the ownership right to the item and owns no less than a quarter. The first one receives three-fourths, as we said, 75% of the item. The other receives one-fourth, and that's also the Rambam, Ilchot Toen Venitan, chapter 9. Now the Gemara asks a basic question, said, Lamali Lamitna, why the Mishnah need to elaborate so much? Why you need to be so verbose, so garlic, so wordy? Litne um, Chada, isn't that enough to say it in one statement and 
We all understand what it's all about. So the Rajba and the Ritva said, um, if you um, have two examples of a claim, um, it appears like total separate cases. And the issue, um, th that's the way Ritva understand, is that just by bringing a little proof, that's not enough. The, um, uh, the idea is that the, the scenario can be the same scenario, but the result of the testimony is two different results, and that's the reason why they need it. So, but anyway, the Gemara respondent said, Chada katane, ze omer ani mtsatia v'chula sheli, ze omer ani mtsatia v'chula sheli. Because the first one, is, he claims that um, uh, I found it and it's all mine. And the other one said, I found it and it's all mine. So basically, each claim total ownership. So there's a book called Ksota Choshen. <coughs> Excuse me, there's another book called Netivot Mishpat. They have a long write up over this discussion because they uh, dealt with the issue it's called Yehush. In uh, back 40 years ago in Yeshivot, when I was a student, we have, if not months, but at least weeks of discussion of the concept of this Yehush. Yehush meaning act of desperation when people give up hope. When people said, there's no way I can uh, find it. So the question is, <coughs> as long as it's not acquire, it's one thing. But um, the Ntivot Mishpat tried to say that you have to differentiate between Habata. You see something from far away and it says, hey, that's mine, what I see over there. Versus when you catch it, you ran and you get it. So the moment the Chidush here is Yatsa Midei Balabaiti. If it's reached a point that there's no honor, is honorless, there is a notion that the school of thought that you may be acquired just by looking of that item. But we are going to study Vitzashem on page 14, a little bit in page 15, this tractate. Scenarios that you see the importance of, of, of all those claims, in the, even in practical halachot. Um, I give you an example. A fellow who live in, uh, in Israel, um, he, um, he's uh, dealing with Judaica a lot. Judaica not books, but more Judaica materials, like uh, cover of the Aron Kodesh, Yad of Sefer Torah, um, uh, Menorah, and other Judaica. And was a non-Jew from Los Angeles who came to Bnei Brak, and um, he basically um, bought from him in a value of about $30,000 materials. So the non-Jew wants to write for him a check. And he said, I've never been in America, I don't know how to use those checks. So he said to him, look, I don't have 30K cash here, but what I can do is, yesterday I bought from someone in Ramat Gan, which is 15 minutes from Nebrak, I, I bought from him, uh, um, I'm sorry, I sold him materials, and I have a check for $30,000. If you're willing to take that check, you have it. So that fellow from Nebrak said fine, and he took that check. That night, the fellow, a non-Jewish fellow from California, flew back. Next day, that uh, merchant from Nebrak wants to go to the bank and deposit the check. Sure enough, you get to the bank, he can't find his check. So he was searching in his purse, in his office, in his home, nothing there. So luckily he tried to retrieve the information and he recalled the name on the check. So he searched in the white pages, etc. He found the guy in Ramat Gan. He went to him, it's a from Jew, it's a religious Jew. And he said to him, did you um, bought something from someone from California? He says, yes, two days ago I bought. You gave him a check for 30K? He said, yes. So he said, you should know, I sold him, you bought from him, but I sold him materials for 30K, and he gave me your check. So he said, so what do you want from me? He says, I lost it. So he asked him, can you write me another check? He says, I don't know you. How do you know that it's not Kenunia? How do you know that maybe you're cheating me, and basically I'm going to lose $30,000? I don't know you. So he sued him. He took him to the rabbinic court in Nebrak, and it wasn't simple. Because in one hand, you can call it 
Shabbat Avida, returning the lost item. On the other hand, you have an issue here of um, Yehush, because the guy said in the past day or whatever it is, he gave up hope on that check. So obviously, after a lot of discussion based on what we mentioned here, the Ketzot Achosh and the Tivot Mishpat, the rabbis tried to rule, ask the other party from Ramat Gan to leave them a check for 60 days to see the other fellow from uh, California never um, use a deposit, any, any, any other checks that lost, and then to put toward the Bet Din the check so the other guy can, can have it. But all the expenses of canceling the check and everything, they impose upon the guy who lost the check. But you see here the holding concept of Yehush uh, and Zchiyah, it's not as, as uh, simple as possible, and that's the reason why we need to have all this discussion. But here the Gemara asks, so why we don't have this claim that one said, I found it and it's all mine. So the Gemara said, if we said that only we accept one claim that when the person said, I am the one who found the item, that each one of them will hold this garment hold, that I am the first one who saw it, this valuable. Even though he is in a circumstance that he is not holding it in his hand, which means we usually require kinyanima, sekinyan, for example, hagbaha, to take it and to lift it up. Right? Here, the only question is by saying, see something valuable and declare ownership, is that sufficient to say it's mine? Tana kula sheli de beriya lo kane. So therefore, here we need to have a special limud, a special notion, a special separate discussion that wants to teach us that by seeing only, it's, um, you cannot acquire a lost item through sight alone. There is a question that was my colleague and friend, a very choshoverov in England, they ask him a question, they, they, re, they redone the entire shul, and particularly the library on his shul. So the Gabay Tzedakah, the people who in charge, the treasurer, and the people in charge for the synagogue, they found a book, valuable book, and they see no stamp, but they see the name of a person. So they ask him a question, is that book belong to the library, or we need to search for the person who has the name of the book, and give it back to him. So... Is that obligation of Hashavat Avedar returning a lost item, or he maybe donated this book to the synagogue? So he tried to hold that most probably you do not need to return it because he said it's a long time, it's most probably it was donated, and it's called Chazaka Bedavar Shasui Lashil Laskir because the assumption is that the fellow is not come there and just. Uh, uh, study with the with, uh, with, uh, book and left it. It's most probably someone who donates. So the Gemara asks, Why you need to use this term? You can say, When the Torah used the term in Dvarim 22, you find a lost item, so it means, the Torah said you cannot ignore. When you see some item that belongs to someone else, you cannot pass by even if you don't like that person. You have to go out of your way to go and return a lost item. So they said, that's obligation to Achicha, to your fellow. So we derive from that that if you go to attachment, meaning you touch it, you don't just see it. So they said, what the Torah meant to say is that you have the capability to touch it. So he said, Umiu Tana, and therefore what we see here, Tana Lishna de Almanakat, the language, and you see it many times in anthropomorphic, it's a language that people use. It's not a biblical language, it's a day by day. Umidechazelei Amar Anash Kichit, the person see it and he claim, I am the one who found it. Even if it's not in his hand, we, we derive from that that, he, that one does not acquire a lost item through sight alone. So they said, So therefore, we, uh, teaches us that the 
Lidigent states def def definitely when he said all of this is mine that one does not acquire a lost item through sight alone. It was a great rabbi by the name of Rav Kerstin in Israel. He was Ilui, he was a great scholar and he unfortunately passed away young. He asked a question over the Bach here because the Bach said if a person found a lost item that belongs to a idolater and he doesn't claim that he bought it. Well, the Torah used the term patur, patur meaning an exempt from searching for the idolater to return the Aveda, but it doesn't mean that it's his. So the Bach asked you a question because you see a disputation between the Bach and the Rosh. Rosh hold that when we said Shnai Mochazim Betalit, when you have two people who hold the item, Yachloku. The question is, how exactly the two people divided? Because in general, the way we understand the Mishnah, you have to have the mitzvah of Hashavat Avida of returning the lost item. So the Rosh hold, you have to speak about CT, that the majority of them are idolaters, are non-Jews. So therefore, the idea of Yachloku, because the Aveda, the lost item, it belongs to them. The Bach disputed the Rosh, and the Bach said, you see that the person acquired it. But my teacher, the late Rabbi Yashiv, tried to explain that the Bach hold that wasn't a Yehush, that when the idolater lost an item, lo have a Yehush, because he doesn't say that our fellow acquired it. He doesn't have the chiyuv, he doesn't have the obligation of Shabbat Abedah, versus the Rosh said that the idolater gave up hope. So whoever lifted up first, he is basically one who acquired it. So now the Gemara said, "Velitne kulashni velo ba'ya ani metzatia." So the Gemara said, "Itani kulashli avamina be'alma diktane metzatia b'riya be'alma kane itani ani metzatia v'adar kulashli the Mishnah itera ashmin and b'riya lo kane." So therefore, for the have the superfluous expression in the Mishnah, we we learn that one does not acquire an item to sight alone. So you, you have to have which we call ma'asek inyan, maharsham, a great. Master in Poland, Marsham, he asked a question which unfortunately happened here in this country a lot. Um, the father-in-law said to his son-in-law, I have a house in the place so and so, and I get several notes from the bank, they're going to um, uh, put a foreclosure against this property. Go, um, I owe them, uh, for example, 150k. Here is a 90k, try to negotiate with them and finish with them a 90k and give it to them. So the son-in-law go there and he negotiates with the bank. The bank doesn't want to go down for in a penny in 150 and the value is much higher. So the bank said to him, look, if you don't give us the 150 that your father-in-law all, uh, we basically tomorrow put it in auction and goodbye. So he's back and forth, back and forth. Eventually he pulled out of his pocket 60K and he, um, f um, with the 90K he had from his uh, in-law and finished the story. So basically the bank now put the name of the property on his son-in-law. So the father-in-law took him to the best dean because the son-in-law refused to transfer the name to his father-in-law. Son-in-law said, look, I'm the one who negotiated with the bank. The bank doesn't want to give it to you. So basically I'm giving you 90K and it's mine. The father-in-law said, look, I sent you there. I, I have original the property. Um, uh, I, I sent you with the condition that you're going to, to finish with them. Sandler said, look, without me present there, it never happened. They'll take it away totally from you. So the Divrei Chaim, the great, <coughs> excuse me, former Tanz Rebbe, and also you see it in a better frame, they ask the question, when exactly you declare ownership and how? Because the moment that the, the father-in-law make the son-in-law shaliach, is that mean that you are an agent in a sense that you have total power because he claimed when he called and tried to negotiate with the father-in-law he was very adamant that he would go up to 90 and not it. And his understanding was basically that uh, he's going to lose the property, just going to give him the 90k back and lose. He puts his 60, but in short, um, the psak that they brought both, the Breit Ephraim and, and, and Divrei Chaim, that, it's, um, that the father-in-law needs to give to his son-in-law 60 and it belongs to the original owner, which is the father-in-law. But again, that's the Marsham. You're welcome to read more uh, Marsham on this Masechet. So, based on our sugya. 
מי מצית אמרת חדא קטני? ה, זה וזה קטני, זה אומר אני מצאתי, זה אומר אני מצאתי, זה אומר כולה שלי. אמר רב פאבא ואיתם הרב שימי בר אשי, ואמרי לה קדי, קדי, זה רבנו חנן סדס, one of the scholar with no name. רישא במציאה, סיפא במקח וממכר. You have to differentiate between the first portion that deal with a, 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 a case of found item where two people found one item. And the last clause, the last part, where each party says all his mind is referring to a case of buying and selling. So when it's Mecca Chominka, where each party claims that he is the one who brought the item to its seller. So then that's the reason of taking an oath, a shvua, because you have uh, um, this type of disputation, but utzricha. So now you see it's necessary for the Mishnah to teach us the ruling with regard to both of them, which is the found item and the regard to Mecca Chominka and the purchase. Would be to be the itan emetzia, meaning if the 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 Mishnah, if the Tanai ne Mishnah only speaks about a situation of found item alone, have a mina emetzia u deram rabanan shvua le mishum demorei veamar chavrei lav midi chaser ba leizel et pis vitpalag baadei. This guy, I don't know if crook is the right word, but he noticed the other guy ran. So he figured out, why should I stay here? Maybe I take advantage of his success, which unfortunately happened. Um, it's a famous Midrash that speaks about the Jewish people left Egypt. And when they left Egypt, they have the error of the people who join our people, not because they want to be part of our people, but because that it's taken out of Egypt. It happens a lot in the Russian Jewry and many other situations. So here this guy, he, um, He saw Reuven, this Shimon saw Reuven run and catch uh, expensive stuff. So he figured out, I'll be part of this game. Chavrai lav midi chaser ba, what did he lose? It's not his talit, it's not his item. So since he's not losing anything, so he didn't uh, put any effort on that. It's not something that you feel, okay, this guy have an arduous effort to make him money or to make something. This guy get it for nothing. He ran and he catch it. So, uh, I hold it, uh, and, and, and it's called more hetele atzmo. He feels to himself that it's okay um, uh, to do such a thing. So the Rashba and the Ridva explained the Rashi that, uh, that said so beautifully in a short word. He said, more hetele atzmo, this guy, this Shimon, he gave himself the right to lechoz babelom mishpat. So, the, so he, he figure out if we, especially if you don't impose on, on him a, a taking a serious oath, so he figure out um, he can do that. But aval But in a regular case, when you have a buying and selling, uh, so you cannot say this a malo. Uh, so the sages, the sages did not impose an oath upon him. So therefore, here's the difference, because here, um, <coughs> the one who's lying, he's really uh, a, a gazlan. He's really taking it in a very um, unscrupulous way. So therefore, you see why the, 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 the rules that you need to leave the talit until Yawanavi will come, which means that, that we have a clarification who is the really owner. And here, again, we have to ask ourselves, when we are imposing an oath upon a person, how far a person can go. If a person really can go to that notion of lying and taking a false oath, um, or you feel like the Ritva and Aran said that he fear taking an oath in such a manner, So you have a seller, he wants to sell a product, you have Reuven who comes to him, let's call him Levi. Levi is selling a product, Reuven comes to him and he wants to buy this product. And Shimon comes after him and he also offered to buy him the product. So Levi wants to sell it to Reuven, so now Shimon said, So I will buy it and let my, my fellow go and, 
and, and, and buy his own. So here, you don't suspect the person to be a total liar, because he doesn't have these feelings, these notions, that taking the something that belongs to someone else, because you figure out, look, he's not losing anything, I'm paying Levi the same amount as he offered him, so it's only an effort for him to find a similar product, or same product by someone else. So therefore, we impose to take an oath upon these two partners that hold this talit, because we do not suspect this person to be a total um, a robber. We don't suspect the person to take a false oath. Um, and we hope that because of this type of oath, if he's not truthful, he will back out. Aval metziah, versus when it's come to a found item, the leka lememarachi, so here the liar cannot find heter leatzmo, allow himself to say that, okay, let my friend go and find another talit. So he is intentionally cause his fellow to lose money. Eimalo. So therefore you see here the tzricha. Tzricha meaning, that's the reason why you need the two avenues. So um, you need to impose an oath upon him. And, the, and this is the reason why you need both cases of Mecha Chumimkar, buying and selling, and Metziah, and found the lost item, to take an oath, and then you can separate that. Uh, uh, again, the way that Rashi explained to us, we assume that this thief, this robber, uh, allow himself, he feels that it's okay to be like that. Uh, the, not everyone's go with Rashi, the Rash and the Ram's not going in that direction. But the, the, uh, the hope, as we said earlier, is that the, that, uh, the whole Takanat Rabbanan, the whole the rabbinic enactment to take an oath is because of this uh, concern that uh, hopefully he will change uh, his mind. Um, the Shita Mekubetzet um, uh, have a, a, a different understanding how far um, you go with uh, leave it for Eliyahu Anavi. So the notion is that one party uh, cares, the, the, the other one said, fine, neither one will gain it. So therefore you have to think that way uh, to find out who is, who is really um, um, owns it or not, or who is not. The Sigmar challenge and said, Mika Chumimka, that each of them in a buying and selling hold, that he is the one who bought it from Levi. So let's go, Pnei Yoshua explains, directly to the, the seller, Levi. And, and ask Levi, tell me, who is the guy from this uh, Ruven and Shimon? He is the, which one you sold this garment? And therefore, by his testimony, we, we can um, um, basically free one of them and give one of them the talit. So, because it's obvious, Levi said, I sold to this one, he didn't sell to that one. So why the Mishnah re required the imposition of both parties to take an oath and only after taking an oath to divide? So they said, Lo tzricha, <coughs> the nakat mechad medate, that one of them received from a seller out of his own will, which is, he wanted to sell this talit, Umechad be'al koche, he received a money from the other party against his will, which means he didn't want to do it. Velo yadana, and we are not sure, miu midate u miu be'al koche. So we are not sure who is against his will and who is not. So the Rosh explained, we said in the introduction that we have different avenues. One of them is called Kol De'alim Gvar. Kol De'alim Gvar, unfortunately, is a rule in some places in the world. Whoever has more forces, whoever has more um, using, um, 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 you know, physical force to take something. So the assumption is the Rosh said that the person fight heavily for something that he believes he owns to the end. He will not give up on this. Tosfot said, when you have two parties that are fighting so hardly, it's hard to say kol de alim gvar because you feel like each one of them is really um, 
um, his. But anyway, Leima Matnitin Loke Ben Anas. I read in a book of my brother-in-law, Dafal Adaf, a uh, beautiful story about uh, the Loke Ben Anas. He brought a story about Rabbi Benjamin Mendelssohn. Rabbi Benjamin Mendelssohn, he rest in peace, was the Rav of the Moshav Komemi Yut, was one of the Haredi Moshav in Israel. So in those years, he used to live in Europe. They brought him a old radio machine. In those days, nobody knows what is that box. So everyone in the village, in a small state today, wants to see what is this box. So you see a machine that all of a sudden the machine to is talking. Right? So, so this little boy, Binyamin, who later became the great Rav Binyamin ben Mendelssohn, he kept studying the Gemara here in Baba Metzia. So one uh, person said to him, you know, uh, isn't that amazing to see a box talking? And he answered, he was in this sugya, he says, I'm all more interesting in what Ben Anas said. So here is Leima Matnitin Deloke Ben Anas. So here, the Gemara suggests that let us say that the Mishnah is not according to opinion of Ben Anas. So, so meaning, the, the Ben Anas is a, one of the important uh, uh, rabbis in the Mishnah, we refer to in Tractate Shvuot. And over there, in Shvuot, page 45, there is a discussion, Chenvani al Pinkaso. You have in those days a um, owner of a grocery store. So this is way before the computer era. So you have Pinkasim, you have those uh, books that he hold. And, um, and he gave to the, 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 the things, the, it's, a, it's a loan to people. And he write down until people pay him. So. Sometimes the owner give to people certain, um, um, he give, for example, money or say, uh, for, for the labor, and he will pay. And the problem is that sometimes there is a disputation. The, the, the um, grocery owner said I gave, and uh, the laborer said they, they didn't receive. So therefore, it's a question who needs to pay what. Sometimes the owner of the store, sometimes is the the individual who wrote those uh, payments, like modern days checks. So here, the Ibn Anas, <coughs> basically there they ask the, the owner to, to, um, um, to um, do it without taking an oath. So they said, the Ibn Anas, over there they said that a man said to his laborer, go, to the storekeeper, and he will give you food in lieu uh, of your salary. S and sometimes later, the laborer claimed that the storekeeper did not give him anything, while the storekeeper claimed that he did. So the rabbis say, the storekeeper and the laborer must each take an oath to support their claims. And the, um, and the employer must pay them both. So here you see the Ben Anas says in response, how can you allow these people, which is the laborer and those people, the storekeeper, to come to take an oath in vain? Why? Because what we understand that one of them is definitely lying. The sages will not impose the taking an oath that by definition must be false. So similarly, we see in a case where the, of the Mishnah here, since the found item is divided between the parties in any case, According to opinion of Ben Anas, they should receive their portions without taking an oath. So the Gemara said, "Afilu teima Ben Anas hatam vadaika shvachav, hacha ika lemem adaleika shvachav, elma detravayu baade adade agbehuha." You see that they 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 both taking an oath in truth because they are lifted the item together that that's kinyan agbaha, and as a result, each of them all. A half of it. So in that case, Ben Nash will agree that they both need to take an oath. So then the Gemara said, Lema Matindin de Lokes Sumchus. Why? Because we learned Bavakame about Shor Shenogachet Apara. If you have a, a, a ox that, uh, that uh, hit a, a cow, 
So we learn in the Mishnah Baba Kama, uh, page 40, 46, um, um, you see an ox that, that gore a, a cow, and they found the, the baby in the side. So the question is, we're not sure if that delivery of, of a baby happened before or after the ox gore the cow. So, 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 so this is called Suffolk. This is something that we're not sure um, what exactly happened, who owns what. So the Ike Sumchus Hamar Mamona Mutal Besafek Cholkin Beloshvua Sumchus hold that you have a case of property of uncertain ownership. The party divided, divided without taking an oath. So, so, so Sumchus. Um, hold that you don't need to take a, an oath for that. Um, so you can follow um, that uh, school of thought and you said the same thing here. So uh, the Shita Mekubetz had an issue of comparing the Shosh and Agach with this. But anyway, If you go by the uh, Rabbanon, by the sages, they said that um, the burden of proof is the rest upon the claimant, climate, and, and in the case of the Mishnah, neither side offers any proof. So they said, Hi, my, Iyamar Bishlama Rabbanan Hata Mudelo Tafsit Ravayu. So over the Bavakama, we said that what? Both of them, both parties are not grasping the property. Amor Rabbanan Mutsi Mechavrola Varaya, the sages said that the, the, the burden of proof rests upon the climate scenes. The one who, uh, um, with possession of the property ostensibly has the right to the property. But Hacha de Travayu Tafse, here you have two people that hold the Talid. Palgila Bishvua, you have to divide it, the, the uh, provision that they take in an oath. You don't need to have aid him, you don't need to have a witnesses. Ela Yamar Tsumchus, Hata, Tafse Travayu, Holkim Loshvua. Here, when you have that both of them grasping the property is not all the more so that they should divide it without taking an oath. So the Mara said, So here, Sumchus said, Look, when you have a situation that of uncertainty, if it's so ambiguous and it's so unclear, therefore, it's a different story. No one knows when exactly the ox gored the cow. So therefore you have a total uncertain situation. But here you talk about total certain claim, and certain claim where the each party states definitely that he is entitled to the property. Sumchus does, does not say that they divide the property without taking an oath. So the Gemara said, Well, Abba Baravuna Damar, Amar Sumchus, Afilu Bariu Bari, Mai Kalemeima. So if you go by the Rabbah Baravuna who said that Sumchus said that even in the case of certain claim and certain claim the parties divide the property without an oath, what is there to say to establish the Mishnah and according to opinion of Sumchus? So they said, Afilu teimah Sumchus, kika amar Sumchus, hei chadika de dara mamona. When they have a financial association, uh, which means you have a chisoron, um, you have ox that go a, a, a cow, and uh, the Shita Mekobat said explains that by doing so, you, you basically um, have a, the, the financial association with the item independent on their claim. But when you have, um, that's the way Rashi said, the Dara Mamona. Uh, <coughs> Avalecha, Tosfot said that you can have the, the, the bed din, uh, not, sh not certain uh, what to do, but he said, Avalecha de leka de dara mamona. But when you have a litigant that does not have a financial association with the item behind this claim, they do not divide it without an oath. So the Ritva explains, um, in our case of the Mishnah, you don't call uh, the financial association because you don't have any laws uh, versus uh, uh, um, when you have a buying and, and, and selling situation. Um, whoever 
is not the one who acquired the talit, he gets his money back. So, avaleicha deleka de dar amarona, lo. So that's the sumchus notion that you need to take the, uh, um, you can divide it without taking an all. Sumchus uh, um, uh, said that you have uh, to divide it without taking an all. Um, that's what we think. So they, they said no, law, which means he hold that in order for them to divide it, they need to take an oath. So the Gemara rejected that. It said, Velav kal v'chomeru. Yet it's not kal v'chomeru ma, tamdei kadidar amamon alemar. Over there we said that they have financial association with them. Vika kadidar amamon alemar. And you have the financial association with them. Why? Because the other party lose half by, uh, by doing such a thing. So just for those who are not familiar with the term, I want to give a really short explanation the way it's uh, done. I'm just reading from the uh, Quran edition. Um, wh when one party makes a certain claim and the other makes an uncertain claim, greater weight is generally attached to the certain claim, although the verdict is not always in his favor. Sometimes both litigants in the court case are capable of making only uncertain claims as they were not present when the incident took place. In such cases, the claims have equal weight. But the truth is, when it's come to halakha, you see it in Be'u Halakha, and you see it also in the Rambam. The Rambam in Ilchot uh, Mechira, chapter 20, and Choshen Mishpat in Shulchan uh, 423, and the Gra said that in case, in a case of a monetary claim, where there is no conclusive proof, like Shoshen Agach Esaporo, so he said, even if the plaintiff states definitely the reason why he is entitled to the money, and the defendant is uncertain whether or not he is liable to pay, the burden of proof rests upon the claimant. This is the basic the opinion of the sages. So <coughs> we have here the the situation of the Dharma Mona. So the, uh, the Dharma Mona, uh, you have different views. Because Rashi hold, Rashi opinion is that it's meant the loss of money in case when one of the both parties involved with the incur lost. Tosford explained that the circumstances themselves give rise to the uncertainty, even without the litigant stating their claims. The Ramba maintained that he's referring to the circumstance where the two litigants do not contradict each other with regard to the primary fact up, uh, upon which their respective claim are based. Uh, the Ramban shows uh, um, that Rabbeinu Hanan and Rambam also interpret the phrase in that manner. The Rashba suggests that both explanations are correct in different contexts, and the Rashi's interpretation is appropriate here. The Rosh explains that it means that the money is undoubtedly belongs to one of them, and this commentary each explain the succeeding steps of the discussion in according to understanding of their terms. So as we said, the Ika the Darama Mona Lemar, Vika the Dara Mona Lemar, Gimela Mudalef 3a, the Ika Le Meimar Kula Lemar, the Ika Le Meimar Kula Lemar. So there is a room to say that belong entirely to one, either way. So therefore, Amar Sumchus, Mamona Mutal Besafek, Holkin Belo Shvua. Because either it's all belongs to the owner of the ox or owner of the cow, so one of them for sure lose inappropriately. So therefore, that's the notion of Sumchus that said that property is uncertain ownership is divided without t taking an oath. Hacha deleka de dara mamona veika deika le memar de travai ulo kol sheken. Because you can have the notion that belongs to both of them. So that's how much so the Kalva Chomer of Lutein was Sumchus. The Gemara responds, Shvuazo mid Rabanani. This type of oath is rabbinic. And he followed the statement of the Rabbi Yochanan, the Amar Rabbi Yochanan, the Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Shvu'a zo, takanat chachamim hi. This oath is a um, rabbinic uh, um, enactment, uh, special, 
that um, in this type of situation, why? Because people can do that. They, they, they go and seize the garment of another person and say, this is mine. So, so that's the idea of total gazlolim, that people more ahead to le'atzma, that people does that um, without... Um, so what we see here, when it's come to sumchus, when the ox core, uh, gore a, a, a cow, um, so that's Bomana Mutal so that's something that is relatively uh, rare, the Ritva said. But what we see here, there are three different avenues of understanding the act of oath in our Mishnah. Number one, according to Rav Papa, Rav Papa said that the reason is because um, one of the people who hold the Talit, more ahead to the Atzmo, so that, therefore the sages make an oath, so he will stay away from these type of things. According to Rabbi Yochan, the second view is to um, basically cause people to fear before uh, doing such a thing, uh, taking a false oath. According to our sugya, you see that the sages disputed sumchus in regards to mamona mutal besafek, the money that we are uncertain. So, so we want to make a, um, this, the ambiguous situation as clear, as lucid as possible. So therefore, you go that direction. I would like to conclude um, with the two notions. Number one is the idea of takonas chachamim. The reason that the sages have such a feeling is because some people like to take advantage or take party of the success of other people. And the Rashash and Beit Alevi, that's the way they understand this from our Mishnah. Um, when you have this Edim, you say that they should yachloku below shvua, that they should divide it without taking note. Because Reuven said, I lifted up. And I, it's all mine. I am the one who zoche. Shimon said the same thing. Each one have the Edim. So therefore, the Edim said that they, 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 the first one have it, so you divide it without uh, taking an, an oath. But as we said, the Ritva tells us if something is very uncommon, is lo shachiyach, you don't have the act of shavua. I would like um, to conclude with the Noida Biyuda. Noida Biyuda brought from his um, uh, Rebbe, his teacher, the Rav of Preshburg. It was a, a discussion over there in the response of Gabay Tzedakah, the people who are in charge for the free Hebrew loan and charity fund. So he managed for the community and he basically took money from the charity fund and, and borrowed it for himself and he returned it. And the question is, is that proper or not proper? Because the new management called that he owned several hundred rubles and he claimed that it's um, um, not correct and um, they tried to prove in their accounting that the first year it shows that and he said not. So the question is, how you uh, rule here? Um, the Rav of Breshburg, based on our sugya, said that um, the, the, since we have the notion of the burden of the proof, it's upon the, the person who claim that uh, the other person owe him, so therefore they, they have the proof, and as long as they don't have the proof, um, they cannot impose upon him neither to take an oath nor to pay something to, to that fund, if it's not a clear evidence uh, or they're taking an oath to prove that uh, he's the one who owes them such a money. But it's a beautiful teshuva, you see it in the Noida Biyuda, Noida Biyuda Madura Tanyana.